This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week is episode 604 and we welcome Dr. Kerry Kinney from the University of Texas at Austin's Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They are the reason IAQ Radio continues to be on the air. And first, before we get uh, to the recording, I want to thank our newest sponsors, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification. Learn more at iicrc.org and Healthy Buildings America 2021. Honolulu, Hawaii, August 10 through 12, 2021. Learn more at hbs2021-america.org. IAQ Radio Association sponsors are the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. Learn more at acgih.org. The Cleaning Industry Research Institute. Learn more at ciriscience.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association. Learn more at iaqa.org. AIHA, healthier workplaces, a healthier world. Learn more at aiha.org. And the Restoration Industry Association. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. IAQ Radio Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories. Learn more at aemlinc.com. Particles Plus. Learn more at particlesplus.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine. Subscriptions available at healthyindoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. The IAQ Radio Trivia Question for today, Friday, October 30th. 2020 has been sponsored by IDEA is a solution chemistry company providing unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Congratulations go out to Doug Conan, Aerotech Environmental, Dayton, Ohio, who was first to correctly identify the 1620s as the time period when the noun resilience was first used. Here's today's IAQ Radio trivia question. Name the legendary animal which, when seen on the University of Texas Austin campus on the way to take an exam, is guaranteed to improve your grade. Back to you, Joe. That's a good one, Cliff. Okay. Today's guest is Dr. Carrie Kinney. She's a professor of civil engineering at the University of Texas and the Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering. Her cross-disciplinary research in environmental engineering and molecular biology centers on the investigation of microorganisms and contaminants in engineered systems, including buildings, residential water systems, and municipal wastewater systems. We're talking a little bit about that today. She has extensive experience working with multidisciplinary teams to investigate human exposure to microorganisms and contaminants in the indoor environment. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kenny. Thank you. Nice well, to be great here. Great to have you. Uh, um, hey, I, I, we were talking earlier in the week, and you're very involved with uh, Healthy Buildings America, and I think this, this one coming up, they're going to focus a lot on research to practice, and we like to say practice to research here, but that's okay. Uh, we can flip it around from time to time. Let's start by your thoughts on how researchers and practitioners can, can learn more from each other. How do we get these groups more involved? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, something I've been interested in for a long time, um, partly because uh, actually I started working in industry before I uh, went back to get my PhD. And um, I learned as much, in that case, it was walking around hazardous waste sites at the time um, from those years that I was working in a consulting firm than, you know, as I did when I was, you know, my four years for my bachelor's degree. And in fact, it's what motivated me to go back and get my doctorate in environmental engineering because I decided 
you know what, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered here. And I'd like to be, you know, contribute to some of those, you know, solutions, if you will. So, you know, I think practitioners and academics, they, unfortunately, they tend to live in two different worlds right now. And they both have contributions um, to make. And I think if we could synergistically, you know, combine both the problem solving that you see in the real world that the practitioners are facing every day, and also they're identifying, here are the real problems that we're seeing in this home or this type of building or whatever it is, that needs to be communicated back to the, the researchers. And the researchers, as we're developing and you know, new knowledge and we're developing potential solutions for some of the problems that have been identified, we need to push that back out to the practitioners because to be honest, they're the ones who are actually doing you know, on the ground work. And so I think it's critical that we have more forums that are not just you know, the academics or the researchers getting together and the practitioners getting together. There needs to be this cross pollination and I think we'll more quickly you know, move towards solutions. And you know, to be honest, the, the pandemic has you know, kind of highlighted how important this is. You know, indoor air quality has always been important, but COVID-19 and everything that comes with it has highlighted how important it is for the folks who are actually, you know, doing cleaning in buildings and the folks who are actually, you know, running HVAC systems and looking at how they're operating. Um, th that information needs to come back to the researchers and vice versa. And so that's why, for instance, Healthy Buildings 2021 is going to be critical. And I like the way you said it. We put research to practice. That's my bad. We should have said research to practice and then put another arrow practice to research. Um, and one of the reasons we're very serious about um, that conference and getting both communities involved is because both have to be in the discussion if we're really going to make some progress. You know, it'd be so nice if we had some kind of a journal or a, yes. uh, something where, you know, you, you took all that research that's out there and kind of broke it down, narrowed it down into some, you know, tips for practitioners. I mean, ISIAC, the International Society for Indoor Air Quality and Climate, they have indoor air, but that's more of a, that's geared more towards researchers, I believe. Has yeah. the group ever talked about something like that or a, a way to get this information out to practitioners in a form they can use? So one of the changes that, you know, so, you know, the, the pandemic has affected everything that we've been working on, right? And so one of the changes that ISIAC made was to, start putting together webinars that were accessible to the you know practitioners and frankly you know people who are running hospitals whatever else right they yep. put on a whole series of these webinars and those were highly successful with regard i mean some of them had five or six hundred people attending right and so i think one thing is um as much as i'm not particularly fond of being recorded and all these other things you know i'm an engineer <laughs> we tend to like our corners um, but we need to do things like this. We need to get out on the radio. We need to get out in those webinars that are open to other, you know, to all segments, right? Not just write our academic journals for our colleagues. We need to write them. That's great. And they need to be peer reviewed. That makes sure that the work is of the highest quality. We, we also, I mean, if you follow the Twitter threads, which I am not a person who can do Twitter very well. <laughs> but I certainly follow the different threads and as papers come out, as webinars come up, as, you know, you know, this broadcast or whatever comes out, that's how we get the word out. So I think part of it is getting over the natural, I wouldn't call it reticence, but I would, I would say natural, um, I don't know, resistance to change. And I think that if anything positive is coming out of COVID-19, it's that there is a recognition that we need to get the information out more quickly and it needs to go more broadly out to all you know, segments from the practitioners to homeowners to, you know, to our other colleagues in academia. Yeah, that's a great point. I really hadn't thought about that, but you're, you're right. These webinars, there have been a lot of webinars recently. Exactly. EPA puts them out, you know, ISIAC has them. Uh, 
AIHA had they put their conference virtual this year, so more more there was more access for people there. So yeah, I think that's a great point. We I know a lot of people get burned out on the webinars, but you know. I also find that they uh, they end up signing up for things that I didn't think they would. I just put one out yesterday for Syria. One of our sponsors is the Cleaning right. Industry Research Institute, and you're working with them now with John Downey, um, and they are putting together a webinar series starting in November on, on COVID. So that's a, that's exactly. a good point. I, I guess what would be nice is after the COVID thing is over, if we could continue can we, to see that. Can we keep the momentum going? And I... Yeah. You know, just as we've had to switch to online classes in some situations and other things, I don't see, you know, the, the advances that we're making in, you know, online education and not that we all want to go online all the time. And like you talk about webinar fatigue, there's Zoom fatigue. We've all got it, right? Yep. But it has pushed us to look at other avenues for delivering information for, you know, the webinars, et cetera, and we record them and we can go back and look at them as we have, you know, if we have a question. So I think, I think we're not going to lose that momentum, honestly. I think that I, there's been a breakthrough. I see it in the way the university is operating it. I see it in the way ISIAC has been reaching out to, you know, um, provide all of these webinars. And I see, see it, you know, certainly when we brought in Healthy Buildings, it's always been the intention, right, that we would have researchers and practitioners together. But now, you know, Siri's helping us organize that conference, for instance, because it's important to have the practitioner voice in the conference and in a real way in these workshops and other things that we're going to um, put, you know, have as part of the conference. I don't think everybody's aware of uh, the conference change. I guess, I guess it's a change this year. Has ISIAC ever partnered with uh, a group like Siri to, to do this? Uh, type um, of I think they were, there's always been, and in fact, on the ISIAC board, they have, you know, representatives from practitioners. So there's always been that, but it's just that in the, the conversations, you know, we've been making sure that, you know, the simple things like we in academia, we put together abstracts and we submit those, right? Well, right. practitioners are like, what's an abstract and why do I need to do this to go give a talk on the things I do every day? So that's the kind of conversations that we've been having. It's because there's these artificial barriers to discussion that, you know, and to interactions that don't need to happen. But to be fair, healthy buildings has always, the goal of healthy buildings has always been to bring together practitioners and researchers. So we have the indoor air quality uh, conference, which certainly has that mix too, but Healthy Buildings has always had that emphasis. It's just now we're trying to figure out, you know, what are the barriers that, you know, practitioners have to coming to a conference such as this? What would they like to see? How would that mesh with what the researchers want to see and how can we promote those interactions? Let's, let's talk a little more about Healthy Buildings America 2021. That will mm -hmm. be in Honolulu. Are you still holding out hope that it will be live? And I know it's both at this point. Uh, still holding out hope for the lives? You know, I'm a, uh, an optimist. Uh, and, you know, of course, that's hard to hold on to these days. But we'd actually already moved it out from June to, you know, August uh, 10th through the 12th. Um, because if you're going to be in Honolulu, um, It'd be nice to truly be there. That's part of it. But the other part is just what we were talking about before. You know, the I want to interact with my colleagues again and talk research. And I want to interact with, you know, the practitioners. I want that in-person interaction and discussions that you get in an in-person forum. And so I think we're, we're really pushing hard to be able to um, – uh, have an in-person event and it certainly will have a live stream components as well because there's some folks who can't make it and in some cases you know practitioners it may not be a good time for them to travel depending on what field they're in right so again just keeping that in mind that you have different constituencies here not just for instance the academics or the researchers do they ever have any um demonstrations like here's a piece of equipment and, and do a demonstration with it or yeah you know, we actually how... yeah they have um and in fact we've been talking about how to how to do this in healthy buildings but 
um, you know, it's been the long tradition, both in indoor air and in healthy buildings to have, you know, I don't know what they called it, indoor air school or something like that. And, you know, you can come a day earlier and we, you know, they'll pick, you know, measurement, indoor air quality, you know, particle measurements or whatever it is, they'll pick a theme and they'll put on a whole hands-on workshop um, mm -hmm. with some theory and everything else. And so that's definitely um, part of what we're hoping uh, to do in healthy buildings. Again, it's all going to depend on um, some factors outside of our control, but we would very much like to include, you know, I just call it indoor air school. <laughs> you, you've done a lot of research yourself on, on the microbiome and, uh, right. you know, how the microbiology of indoor environments affects people and I think kids in particular. What from your research would you like practitioners to be able to, you know, take hold of and, and, and uh, incorporate into their, you know, their daily work? Um, so one is just both for practitioners and for, you know, the general public, I think understanding that we live in a microbial world. We have microorganisms all over our skin at the moment, and there are microorganisms in the air and allergens. And so microbial exposures in and of themselves are not necessarily a, a problem. It's only when the balance, if you will, gets out of whack. And so one, understanding that like in our homes and built environments, many of the microorganisms that we see, particularly bacterial uh, bacteria, are actually... Um, they can be coming from us, from our skin associated bacteria, as an example. So there's a human fingerprint to the bacteria that you find in any indoor environment. So we seed our own environment. For fungal communities, a lot of times it's either coming from outdoors. So you'll see a location to location variation and certainly a, um, a, um, a seasonal variation as well. Um, but also, you know, and this is, I'm sure the folks in the restoration industry know this, you know, if you get too much moisture building up in the wrong place, um, you know, fungi have adapted to growing on a whole wide variety of materials and they will, you'll get essentially an imbalance, if you will, in the fungal ecology in the home and you can have some exposures that can be particularly harmful for certain subgroups. Um, the other thing I think that people should understand is that um, some, what, so there's this human imprint, if you will, but there's also, there's a, um, I'm seeing people uh, flash up the answers. I'm seeing one I really like, but I'm not going to say anything. Right. Um, well. <laughs> answer to the Bebo, uh, the question of the day. Um, but if we're talking about, where was I now? Um, oh, talking about microbial exposure. So one, there's a human imprint and that's natural. Two, we have, um, there's actually protective microbial exposures. So not all microbial exposures are necessarily a bad thing. So when you look at childhood asthma, which is one of the areas that we've been looking at, um, and when we look at us and many other researchers, right, there's, you hear the term farm-like microbiome, but it turns out there's a subset of tax, uh, we call them taxa, microbial, microorganisms, that are actually protective against the development of asthma. So early exposure to the right microorganisms, if you will, is actually very healthy. And what we're trying to understand then is in what, you know, cause you're, you're exposed to a, you know, a very complex mixture of both bacteria and fungi, both in the air you breathe. And I know this is the indoor air quality thing, but I've also looked at shower studies. So, you know, microorganisms also enter your house through your shower and if you, Think about it. When was the last time you cleaned your shower head? Just ponder that a while, okay? So we're being exposed to microorganisms all the time. And so what we're trying to figure out in all of these studies, these microbiome studies is of this mixture, what are the home factors? Like how the HVAC system's running, moisture conditions, climate, cleaning practices. And we're looking at that certainly in the COVID-19 uh, era. What, how do those affect the types of microorganisms that you see, or in this case, we've, we've been looking at for SARS-CoV, um, that you know have a negative of health, a potential negative health impact, and also those that could be protective. And that's you know difficult to tease out, but that's what we work really hard at. And generally speaking, are are there things that 
I know this is probably down the road somewhere, but are there things we can do to help encourage the uh, having more of those beneficial microbes in our home as opposed to the not so beneficial ones? Well, there's, there's folks that are researching just that. I think they, you know, a healthy inoculum, you know, like there's a healthy inoculum that you can have when, you know, early in life. And how do we like perpetuate that through the rest of your life? I think that's still an open area of uh, research, to be quite honest. Um, and uh, there's, you kind of have to also go beyond, um, if you will, just who's there. I call it the who's there, Joe and Jim, which is my names for the microorganisms, because if you've looked at them, they're very long and complicated, right? Mm -hmm. Looking at who's there and in what relative abundance, right? That's certainly important. And that's a lot of microbiome work has been looking at that. We've also, in terms of some of our dust studies, have started looking at, well, can we get at the measure um, that we're interested in? So for instance, I look at respiratory health and I also happen to have asthma, right? So, you know, it's personal to me a little bit. And in fact, um, had to use my inhaler this morning, okay? So <laughs> truth mm -hmm. be told. So the, the question is, um, for instance, we've been working with some uh, researchers at Larkin University trying to figure out what's the inflammatory potential of that dust. In other words, can we get at something that actually gives you an idea of how your body might respond to this kind of mix of microorganisms on this dust? And the other thing I kind of want to uh, make sure we understand is it's not all about just the microbes. There's this interaction, if you will, with the chemicals that we bring into our home environment. So whether we're looking at chemicals that we're cleaning with or, you know, even more, you know, like the SVOC's uh, work that uh, Inju and others have done, looking at, you know, flame retardants, plasticizers um, that are present in many of the products that we bring into our homes. We actually, when we're doing like our filter dust sampling and home dust sampling, we not only look at the microbiome and not only look at the inflammatory potential, which is, you know, kind of a measure of you know, um, how your body might react to breathing in that dust. But we also look at the chemical contaminants that are found on the dust. And then the other thing is, is that, and as we've been looking at which animal is lucky to see if you uh, hear going to an exam at UT Austin, so I'm seeing the answers flip up, we're also looking at allergens. So you okay. can have outdoor fungal allergens, right? You can also have um, I don't know if you've heard of cedar fever, right? There's the pollen here um, in winter um, is very asthmogenic. Um, and we also happened on the fungal side, the alternaria alternata naturally present in the outdoor environment here is also an asthmogen, if you will. So we kind of have this mixture of their natural, but we bring them into our indoor environment and what coupling of that with the chemical exposures like DHP is one that folks are starting to hone in on having a, a effect on uh, asthma. I mean, it's one we saw in one of our studies as well. So again, it's not just microbiome. Everybody likes to stick into their little box, if you will. It's not just microbiome. It's microbiome, it's allergens, it's health effects, and it's chemicals as well, contaminants. And some of which we you bring in, of course, into our own indoor environments in the different products that we have. Cliff, uh, let me have you jump in here if you want. Yeah, I, I would, uh, doctor. I just learned something uh, about dust that was was pretty surprising, actually. I, I was consulting on a that? project. Well, I was going to I was uh, consulting on a product project in which there was a strange odor uh, in a house, and no one could really identify it. And one of the things that the homeowners had done, this is following a water damage, they actually added ultraviolet lights to the HVAC system in an yep. attempt to, uh, you know, sanitize the air and control the odor. And when they did that, uh, they had to leave the house because all these other odors were created. And what I found is I actually found a study on, uh, I'm not sure whether you're aware of it, but you probably are, uh, on ultraviolet light and house dust, particularly hair and skin, and that it creates uh, a, a very unique odor, and it's very sulfurous. And uh, I found a study, uh, I'll, I'll link it into the blog, but 
Uh, I, I believe that's what happened in this particular situation. And I think that's the link between what you're saying. You know, people are worried about these microbes. They want to do something about it. They install the system and they don't necessarily understand that there's, that there can be a reaction between what they do and right. what they're trying to remediate. And absolutely. And in fact, um, the uh, researchers Attila Novoselic and Pavel Mitzal, who are uh, in the same department as I am and also were part of the Building Energy and Environments program, they have um, some of the coolest toys. One is, of course, we have the UT test house. We have a full test house we can test things out in. Mm -hmm. But also, um, we have a full scale, um, basically, HVAC system. And mm -hmm. we can test you know, putting in a cleaner or something in one side of the filter and looking loaded clean or not clean. Because I, as you know, dust is a complex mixture of things, especially when it gets into the filters. Um, you know, my, my father was saying, you know, I know you're doing some really high end research, but what are those dust balls made of? He kept asking me what the dust balls were made of, which, you know, is hair and all these other things, right? So, um, but bottom line is we have this system and they can look at it in the presence of, you know, normal background ozone levels. You can put in a, you know, some UVC system, you can put in a plasma system and then you can, or peroxide. There's all sorts of cleaning techniques that people are looking at for both in homes, you know, or in, in hospitals and other places, schools and you know, they're either putting them in the duct or they're actually using them on surfaces within the built environment. And one of the questions is when that pulls into your filter and gets in contact with the dust that's on your filter or in your duct work or in your home, there's, it's no surprising that there's this complex mixture of products that you can form depending on the conditions that you've done. So I am not surprised at all that it smelled. Um, as you know, you can, uh, for instance, you can ozonate materials to uh, clean them, but you will generate its ozone, just as an example, is a non-specific oxidant. It's going to find an organic and you'll get all of these, you know, byproducts that are formed. And this is not, if, and again, we're talking about indoor air, it's not new. So for instance, they use ozone to disinfect water and all the organics that you, mixture stuff you have in water, guess what? They also react with ozone in a non-specific way. Now it's a pretty good biocide. So you got that. But then now people are focusing, okay, what else does it generate for that or chloramines, any of the disinfectants in water? So what you'll start to see are themes that carry across. If you consider the you know, indoor environment also includes what's coming in on your water system, what's coming in with your materials that you're bringing into your house, what certainly your ventilation system is hugely important. All of those things and temperature, humidity, right? Moisture balance in all of these different places. All of those interact to essentially set what you're going to be breathing in with regard to, you know, the odors. And it's always interesting because odors, you know, you can detect things pretty well at low concentrations. You said sulfur. So sulfur happens to have a very low odor threshold, which is one of the reasons, you know, we don't, it's pretty, you know, most people don't like the smell of sulfur, let's just put it that way, right? So I'm not too surprised to answer your question that they would see this kind of variety of products. And in fact, Pavel's got um, uh, what we call the sniffer, but it can do real time part per trillion measurements of, um, he does you know, before and after the filter and he does a bunch of different indoor air type um, applications. So um, he joined us a couple years ago and you know, we can't, sniff enough things because we're having so much fun with his instrumentation, <laughs> to be what honest. What about hydroxyls? Have you had any, uh, done any work on that? Question. I haven't, although many of these things will generate hydroxyl radicals and that's yeah. actually the non-specific oxidant that then, you know, interacting with all the different materials. But that certainly is part of the study that um, Pavel and um, Attila have been doing They've also been looking at masks, um, you know, interactions with materials on masks when you're like doing cleaning. Um, they've look at, been looking at applying, you know, kind of just uh, commercial cleaners to different surfaces and then looking at not only what's kind of the primary product, which is the thing that comes off initially, which is actually in the cleaner itself, 
and then how it's interacting with the different surfaces and what are those secondary or tertiary, tertiary that's a fancy word for third products, that are being generated. And, you know, so a lot of this work is being done, you know, in, in, and it's very active, obviously, because we're cleaning more than ever for good reasons. Well, and that's exactly where I was headed. We're, we're going to have to go to halftime in a minute, but before we do, I wonder, I know through the home chem study and at the test home, you have been, your, your group um, and your colleagues have been doing a lot of research on cleaning products and the, the byproducts of cleaning. And with COVID, mm -hmm. people were going crazy with, you know, cleaning and buying new things right. for their home and so on. Do you have any tips you would give people with respect to cleaning products? Um, well, one of the things that um, you'll notice is when we started looking at this, and actually it's an area that we're continuing to research. So to simply put, I don't have all the answers, but um, give us another year and we'll probably have quite a few. But one thing I think you'll recognize is if you go to the EPA approved list for um, the what works on SARS-CoV-2, um, killing the virus that causes COVID-19, you'll see that actually the active ingredients in the list of approved cleaners that are, you know, that are known to kill it quickly, which is a good thing. Um, there aren't at many different types of active cleaners, if you know, like the active ingredient, if you will, in these cleaners. So I think one way we can simplify work, if you will, is not focusing on, you know, you know commercial product one versus two versus four, is looking at active ingredient one versus active ingredient two. There's some that are like in 50% of the products, they really are the active ingredient that's giving you the, the kill, if you will, the inactivation of the, the viral or microbial pathogen. So I think a really fundamental study looking at that and then looking at how it carries through into you know, ventilation systems or something else like that, that's one of the studies that we're working on now because we can couple the two that we have given the, the, the instrumentation. So I guess my takeaway is um, personally, um, in terms of like a practical takeaway is when you're using these cleaners, like let's say you're using them in a school with a bunch of children, as an example, mm -hmm. I would clean and then I would flush um, with, so this is a combination where if you're cleaning and then we've got some volatile products that may or may not, you know, cause some um, issues for say young children or those with asthma, then I would flush with clean, hopefully clean outside air to reduce that concentration before the children show up. And I then secondarily, really yeah, for the practitioner, uh, for the folks who are applying this day in and day out, I think we need to understand their exposures because those are gonna be substantially higher than even the kids that go in, you know, after a cleaner has been applied what about the person who goes from room to room to room to room to room and then repeats that effort? I think we need to think carefully about, you know, let's call them essential workers, but the folks who are actually doing the cleaning, I think we need to understand what levels of exposure they're getting and whether those are a concern or not. Okay. I like that to flush. I don't know that we've talked much about that in the past. We're going to stop here and thank our sponsors. We'll be back okay. in 90 seconds with Dr. Kerry Kinney. IAQ Radio Industry Sponsors are Particles Plus Engineers and Manufacturers of Feature-Rich Particle Counters and Air Quality Monitoring Instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at IAQA.org. 
The American Industrial Hygiene Association, AIHA. Healthier workplaces, a healthier world. Learn more at AIHA.org. And RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. Siri, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. See more deeply through science and research. Learn more at siriscience.org. That's C-I-R-I science.org. A-C-G-I-H, advancing the careers of professionals working in the environmental health, industrial hygiene, and safety communities. Interested in defining their science at A-C-G-I-H dot org. And let's not forget the IICRC, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification. You can learn more about them at IICRC.org and Healthy Buildings America 2021. Learn more at HB2021-America.org. We're back with Carrie Kinney. Dr. Kinney, you have been doing work on filter forensics, and that has always kind of fascinated me as someone that, you know, I used to do more, but, um, you know, I used to do a good bit of consulting and going into people's homes, and we could never quite figure out how to use that filter, you know, to, to assist with doing a, uh, an investigation in a home. What are you learning through filter forensics, and um, how would that maybe apply to people doing this type of work in the field? Yeah, so one of the challenges, of course, when you're doing um, indoor, um, you know, like investigations of people's home environment, it's just the logistics, right, of bringing in your own samplers and all these other things. And so um, several years ago, um, Jeff Siegel and I, uh, when Jeff was still at UT Austin and not at the other U of T, which is also a very good school, you have to admit, uh, we were sorry to lose him. But uh, anyway, he... Uh, he and I um, started a project um, which is based on, you know, the understanding that um, HVAC filters in people's homes, as an example, but you can also do them in other buildings, and we are doing that. You can, they provide an integrated sample of the indoor environment. They're pulling, it had to have been airborne to get into the filter, and yet yeah, some mix of outdoor and indoor air, but so is what you're breathing, right? So it provides an a nice sample that's already built into people's homes that we can then ask them, can we uh, take samples of your uh, filter dust? And we, um, in our first study, uh, we did 60 homes over two seasons, so 120 visits, but we analyzed a lot of dirty filters and um, we looked at them for, you know, microbial, both bacterial and fungal communities, we looked at them um, with respect to the phthalates and flame retardants. Um, we looked at allergens, selected allergens. And then what we did is we took all of that data. And in our case, in that particular study, we were looking at, you know, how does it relate to childhood asthma or the severity of asthma for the kids within those homes? And one thing I learned from that experience is one, these are, you know, readily available samples. When you, you ask somebody if they want to give you their dirty air filter, if you give them a new one, that is not a hard, uh, <laughs> hard process, right? But no we found that in that first study, we were also, you know, it's just logistics and you're going into people's homes and asking them questions because we coupled that with a lot of questions about, you know, how many people in the home, whether they had pets, you know, some of the standard things you would ask about a home. So in this new study, um, we call it community filter forensics. We're actually, um, and we just piloted it last um, summer and we're going out again, is we actually you know, realized that community members are perfectly capable of taking a dust sample off of their filter. So we've actually been asking folks, we send them a little handheld vacuum cleaner. It has a little uh, nozzle in it that they can pop in. They vacuum uh, a sample of their filter and they pull out the little nozzle. So it's a much smaller than the whole filter going to us because you can imagine. And in fact, the first study, we filled up an entire cold room with these filters. So let's just say the thimbles are a little bit more shippable. And we looked at how we can ship those back. And we look at microbiome and we're doing all of these analyses now, but they're provided by the community. 
And then what we do is we actually send out, and this is some of the work I'm also doing with whole communities, is we use phone app basically to push out a survey to our participants to say, can you answer these questions as well? So we're getting the data about the home environment. And if, if, they, you know, if there happens to be you know, a child with asthma or something else, we can ask them about their symptoms. We're getting that information coupled with an actual sample that all of which is being provided by the community members. And so we've been working on how, you know, some of the logistics like um, Austin's, not, not now, you can see I'm wearing a sweater, but generally we're a hot and humid place. So one of the first logistical <laughs> hurdles we had to get over, um, and this, you know, I'd learned from Andy Hoisington, one of my uh, uh, doctoral students who's now off doing great things in the indoor air world, he um, had done an initial uh, shipping study to look at what is the temperatures these samples would be experiencing. And mm -hmm. so we did that within, you know, looked at different shipping times, you know, dates, different parts of the city, it's a pretty big area. And then also we, of course, looked at different, um, you know, ways to cool the samples. And so now we know how to ship them so we maintain the, you know, the temperature in a reasonable zone so it doesn't cook the samples basically by the time you get them. So we've been looking at this remote data collection um, as a way to get both samples and data from, you know, participants. And um, as part of this other effort, Whole Communities Whole Health, we're actually trying now to not just collect the data remotely, but actually develop a dashboard so we can start building feedback to the participants in any of these studies so that they have the information right away, right? Or at least near real time as you can give it to them mm -hmm. in a way that's useful. And so um, it may be that not every household, of course, has a computer, but most households have phones, right? And so we've been kind of focusing on how we can use cell phones, push things out to, you know, survey questions out to our participants via cell phone. How do we get the data back? How do we look at different modalities of measurement? So, you know, you can, um, we've been looking at low cost uh, indoor air quality sensors that we can deploy in a bunch of homes, but you know, how would that work in terms of the data streaming? Um, can we couple it with wearables? You know, your Fitbit actually, if you have a Fitbit or if we send our participants Fitbits, which we've done recently with a UT Austin cohort, um, we can get information on, you know, um, physical activity. And also, you know, one of my uh, doctoral students uh, working with Zoltan Nagy and the rest of this team has been looking at, you know, self-report sleep versus, you know, what the Fitbit says in terms of your sleep quality. And then we can tie that to like indoor air quality in the bedroom or some other metric. So we're looking at expanding and using the technologies that are available to collect data more efficiently in more places. And then particularly when we're working with communities that, you know, typically like vulnerable communities that really do need this information, can we work with them First of all, to ask them, what are you interested in learning about? Because oftentimes in this, you know, you talk about a divide between practitioners and researchers. Mm -hmm. The same divide happens between community members when you ask them, what are your concerns about indoor air or about, we're looking at both social and um, environmental determinants of health. Like, what are your concerns about your community and your home and your health? Ask those questions and try to address those questions instead of kind of coming in with what you think should be the question, if you will. And so sure. we're trying to reimagine working in, and this is a very broad group across the university with folks in, certainly in engineering, but for the, like some of the technical and data streaming elements, but we're working with people in social sciences, education, communication to, and then um, working with the community itself and going, doing focus groups, which I didn't even know what they were before, right? So. You know, engineers, we like to tinker, but we don't necessarily talk to folks as much as we should. And this is closing that gap between those two so we can start to actually, you know, why is it that we can, you know, have a phone app to, I don't know, look at the weather, but we can't say what's in our home, right, on a health basis, right? You know, my dream is that, you know, 
um, particularly communities that have higher exposures to pollutants just due to where they are, right? Outdoor pollutants making their way in or are essential workers and we're worried about, you know, when they come back home, you know, what can, what can be the concerns in the COVID-19 pandemic and ventilation rates and other things. Can we provide service to those communities as, you know, in addition to, a, you know, addressing these high level questions that happen obviously that are of concern to everybody. And that's what I think is exciting is if you can start to break out of your comfort zone and start talking, you know, you researchers talking with practitioners and actually getting some understanding. And then also researchers talking with, you know, the community and also listening to what the community has to say, I think is all equally important. What, what type of information are they interested in that you find surprising? So the, um, the very first project that I um, had looking at filter forensics, for instance, right? And I'm all very excited about what we find on the filters. And we came back and we're doing a workshop with our um, participants who were all just amazing families. I mean, they were lovely. We couldn't have done, you know, we couldn't have gotten a better community to work with. They were awesome. But, you know, here I am talking about what's on the filters and everything else. And they had a lot of questions about how do I, what cleaners should I be using? Okay. I had not asked the question, you know, I'd written the proposal, I've done everything all very well intentioned. I didn't ask ahead of time. If uh, so, did I actually include that in the survey questions about cleaning products that people were using or how they cleaned their homes or no, should I have? Yes, I should have asked. And so guess what? We're, <laughs> first of all, in the one we're doing now, we're doing the remote collection of the filter dust, you darn well, Sure, I'm asking all about cleaning practices, types of cleaners, how often you do it. Um, and I, I'm laughing because I'm like, you know, you really don't want to know how little I clean my house, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> relatively, so many of these families, they are cleaning much better than I ever will. Um, but that was a very, you know, I learned something from that interaction with the, the community members when I realized I'd never asked. And so with this whole community's whole health effort, we're actually just doing the focus groups and it's not just around environmental exposures. They're asking them about, you know, um, what is, you know, the, like some of the social determinants of health and whether they've, you know, face discrimination in their things. What about COVID-19 and, you know, what, how has that affected you? And are there other types of what we call biological measures of health that you would like to get, you know, to have answered. And so, um, in some ways, it slows you down. In other ways, you're actually moving in the right direction, if you know what I mean. So, um, and I don't mean slow you down in a bad way. What I mean is you have to have the patience to work through the process to actually get those things answered. And that's what we're doing kind of methodically or more methodically with the whole community's whole health is we bring in a, people from many different perspectives. We're going out to our community to ask the questions, to get the answers, to make sure that when I go in and I've got like a wearable or something else, I know why they're interested in it. And also they can help us shape how we get what they call a dashboard, which is essentially what you see on your phone. Like, how would you like the data back to you? You know, what data would you like to see every day or what data do you never want to see? I mean, that's the sort of thing that we really need to do more broadly, I think in indoor air quality to be more inclusive about and also to ask the right questions. So I know right. a lot more about cleaners now, folks, um, in terms <laughs> of what's being used. Um, and, you know, of course, we, we, we deployed many of these things also when COVID-19 hit. We, um, you know, uh, employed some of these uh, surveys about sleep quality and, you know, social distancing behavior. We've been doing several studies with pilot group, uh, pilot uh, studies with UT cohorts of UT Austin students and faculty who's ever willing to try it out. Because, you know, one thing about uh, students and others, they have no problem telling you if it's a problem or it's broken or whatever else. And we want to make sure that we get it, the, the bugs worked out, if you will, um, in terms of how the data comes in and how we might be able to stream the data back. And so we're still working that all out. But um, some of what we've developed actually 
has been extremely helpful as we're trying to understand the impact of COVID-19 on all different types of, you know, aspects of life. Well, it, it may also be helpful to other groups. I noticed uh, Linda Wigington was in on listening in on the call, and she was Roxas uh, reducing outdoor contaminants in indoor spaces. And we talked about that earlier in the week. I don't know if they're using a phone app, but that's an interesting way of you know getting that feedback and and being able to collect all that data. So I, I yeah. think uh, you're and on. I actually uh, went and looked at her website, so I'm very excited to see others. Uh, doing some of the work. I particularly like the fans with the filters on them. Those are my actual favorite. I'm going to go oh, rig yeah. one up for this room since I uh, am allergic to the outdoor dust, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> outdoor yeah. allergens get me. They work. All right, let's go to the roundup. Uh, we're going to go to the roundup, ask one more question each. We'll bring in the Restoration Industry Global Watchdog and uh, the Z-Man. All right, let's go to the let's go first to the Z-Man. Cliff, uh, any final thoughts, questions? You know, you know, when it comes to COVID, you know, soap and water cleans it, and you know, I think that pretty much there's a, a big overreaction. People are trying to use things that'll kill tuberculosis and kill anthrax and other very very hard to kill organisms to clean something that's really not living in the first place. But I think that there are some things, you know, for instance, citric acid, it is antimicrobial, you know, you can eat it. And I don't know whether you studied that, but you might want to do that because uh, it's, it's not a bad cleaner and it's pretty safe and it's inexpensive and it's readily available. And, you know, by the so time- So in other words, looking at, for those that are doing the cleaning work, which, is, you know, Pavel and others, I think that looking at the commercial ones and then alternatives as well to kind of look at the full range of cleaners. I agree, that would be a good idea, yeah. No problem, that's just a suggestion, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to Pete Consigli. Pete, any comments, questions? Well, I, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation and uh, uh, Carrie, you, you know a lot of the people, you know, that uh, that we've interacted with and influenced, you know, all the ISIAC people and of course Downey and the, the whole Siri group and whatnot. Yep. So it'll be interesting. I, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, 2021, that, uh, you know, the global pandemic will be under control so that uh, we, we get to go lie on the beach in sunny Hawaii, you know, uh, when we're not in the uh, meeting rooms, uh, you know, debating all these indoor air quality issues. So I guess really only time can tell, you know, it's, it's made it really hard for any kind of planning which I'm, so, I'm sure, you know, from an academic yeah. standpoint, all the associations, the industry, it's, you know, you got to plan these things way out and it really makes it really tough. So, uh, but, you know, what's, um, how, how are things, just from your perspective, from a campus, mm -hmm. um, what's going on there? You know, I, I know that when uh, the COVID, you know, I have a lot of my family and stuff that have been in the academic world and that kind of a thing. I know that the first campus, when, this, when they all started returning back, Oh, several months ago, uh, the University of North Carolina had a whole outbreak and that thing hit all the wires. And now it's, you know, now that the sports seasons are all going, it's, uh, you know, it's pretty commonplace. But I think some lessons have been learned and people have got to handle. But, you know, calling in from Texas, you know, every year I always look to, look to the Red River rivalry. It was always the first really big game of the college football season. It kind of, you know, now it's uh, – doesn't have the same meaning with all these issues, but how, so how are things going on the campus? Uh, talk a little bit about that, because I don't think we really addressed any of that. And I got to imagine whatever's going on on your campus is, is, would be pretty reflective of most, uh, most college campuses in the country. So I'm curious. Yeah, so we've got, you know, we've got a lot of, um, you know, web-based classes. We also have for blended classes, or we call them hybrid classes for the students who, you know, they really need to be in the lab or they need a small discussion group. So um, actually, you know, it's interesting, the, the amount of effort, I watched uh, UT Austin, we also have Dell Medical School here, um, and they, the amount of effort they put into looking at the ventilation systems, figuring out how they were going to, you know, just the simple things, block off chairs, what was going to be open, what was going to be closed, what should be the occupancy level in the, the dorms. How should they clean and deliver food and other things in like the, you know, the um, um, dining halls and other places. And 
all I can tell you is that I, I was amazed at, you know, every researcher who had anything, anything to contribute was basically working with the university, trying to guide them toward the best practice that we could come up with, obviously with changing information over time, right? And um, so it's been um, in some ways humbling and in some ways, um, uh, how do I say this? You know, you just realize to do things right and you know, UT Austin is like a city of 70,000 to be honest, right? With all the grad students and staff and everything else. You know, it's a microcosm of the things that we were facing beyond, beyond our, you know, beyond the edge of the campus, right? And they blend over. All I can say is that there were, you know, the folks in the BEE program were talking with facilities about how ventilation works and what are the best strategies for that in the different buildings. There were folks that were looking at how to get contact tracing going. Um, they converted my microbiome, not my particular lab, but we have a core sequencing facility and they stopped all the, you know, kind of just microbiome regular sequencing stuff for a while so they could run COVID-19 tests for anybody who wanted them for free on campus, you know, of the UT community, obviously and do it in, you know, with a quick run around, uh, turnaround time, right? And so, like, all resources at the university were being geared toward this, I would say. So it's been kind of a heroic effort, and um, I think, you know, we talk about building controls and other things being very important. Also, the social distancing policies, the masks, all of it's important. You can't just say, oh, this is the only way to go. Every facet of the university has to look at what's going on and do their very best with it. And that includes cleaning strategies, that includes ventilation strategies for the building and the built environment. And we're looking at wastewater, right? So I'm working with some colleagues that are doing wastewater monitoring as well. You also have to have different ways to try to do monitoring of where is the virus and can we predict when it might come back? Interesting. I, I got a quick question for you. You, you yeah. mentioned uh, sleep and uh, part of the whole community's whole health was you were, you were asking questions about sleep and, and maybe what affects sleep. And you're also working with like social scientists and, instead of just, you know, uh, microbiologists and so on and so forth. What kind of things have you learned about sleep that either surprised you or kind of maybe confirmed what you already thought. Um, I'm just, I think that's a really understudied area. Well, one of the, the things that's really interesting, okay, is that trying to understand, so from an indoor air quality perspective, what facet of indoor air quality, like in, the, like in your bedroom, for instance, will actually affect your sleep quality? And if you do that in isolation, you might get one set of results. But we all kind of intuitively know that physical, well, it's been shown, right? Physical exercise, um, stress, other things can affect, uh, uh, you know, sleep quality as well. And then how do you measure sleep quality outside of a sleep lab in a way that gives you, you know, you know quantitative information? And so one advantage of the whole community's whole health effort is that we have you know, folks who are asking about mood and stress levels, and we can actually, in some cases, if they agreed to, we can actually measure an integrated measure of stress, which is uh, via a hair sample, via one of my colleagues, Francis Champagne. So we can look at the like biological measures, self-reported measures of stress as an example. And then we can look at self-reported sleep and also um, what we see on, say, a wearable, if they, you know, uh, what the wearable might tell you about sleep quality and how efficient your sleep was that night. And then we can look at how much exercise maybe you got that day and other elements or indoor air quality. So we were looking at CO2, PM 2.5, and uh, NO2 um, in the, the, built, uh, the bedroom um, for some of these uh, participants. And so it's the richer information that I think helps you understand um, the each how each might be contributing to sleep quality so is it just indoor air quality or is it that combination if you're stressed out i don't you know as any and the psychologists are groaning because i'm simplifying obviously but um i think that that's 
by being willing to look at things beyond your discipline, you might actually get to some, some answers that would, you know, that are unexpected, I guess. And so I'm, oh. I'm super excited. Hagen Fritz is the uh, PhD student in Zoltan Nagy. All of this requires, and Cameron Craddock and all these folks, it requires big data too. So they have to be able to handle more than a day's worth of data. You monitor, you know, for, you know, a month, right? 24 hours a day, that's a lot of data points. And so that having folks who can handle and interpret data, gigs of data, right, is really important. And then trying to figure out, this is what we're working on now, is like trying to figure out now, how do we kind of make dashboards and figure out how to feed this back to community members? And that's sort of what we're, you know, we're at that stage now. We're trying to figure out the data pipelines and analysis, and then how do you feed it back? Great stuff. Um, Pete, did you have hey, a question? Uh, yeah, I had a quick question. I, I wanted to wait this one until the end of the show before we logged off, because if I didn't ask it, I would just feel terrible. So, look, Austin is known as a world-class food scene, great barbecue city. And so oh. you know, I, I, anyone who knows me, I'm, they know I'm an aficionado foodie. So my question is, how has the COVID affected you know, the restaurants, the barbecue, the takeout, you know, all that stuff. I mean, it's got to be killing the residents, you know. I mean, what's up with that? Come on, Doc, you got to uh, let us know. <laughs> you know, all I can say is if I have to eat any more of my home-cooked meals, I'm going to just be <laughs> spitting mad. Um, so the challenge with Austin is they have an amazing food culture, music culture, all of which involves interacting with people, right? And, yep. you know, uh, the pandemic has really been hard. Some of the, you know, longtime restaurants that have been here for 20, 30 years have actually closed, right? Others have been able to pivot to curbside, and now I think we have either 50% or maybe even greater occupancy levels, you know, with the distancing and outside patios and those things. So all I can say is that I consider it my Austin civic duty to order food from the restaurants that are still open and to eat them with great joy, which is magnified by the fact that even though my, actually my families are fabulous cooks, at some point you just don't want to cook and you don't want to do the dishes, you want to have a beautiful meal. And so I can say Austin has been doing their darndest and I see people actually, you know, ordering things local, buying local, certainly um, restaurants that I've been going to for 20 years. Even if I'm not necessarily in the mood for eat at, you know, eating out that night, I will order food from that restaurant because I think it's a, you know, it's what I can do. And not to mention, I love well, it. So. It's a well, beautiful good, good, Yeah, good for you. And, uh, you know, I, all the years of our famous summer camp, I, we have a lot of Texans there and they do world-class stuff. But uh, the only issue I always have with them, because I'm a Sicilian kid and my grandmother taught me how to take grass and make it taste like the best tasting vegetable. And I was kid the Texas. I say, you know, you guys have to compensate because you consider bacon a vegetable. I said, that, that just doesn't work with vegetarians. You know, I won't even get into the vegans. But anyway, we have a good, a good uh, playful uh, kidding about that. But um, anyway, I, uh, I'm sad to hear that some of those restaurants are closed. It's kind of happening in a lot of cities. But, uh, yeah. you know, I know that the Austin barbecue is, in, is just really second to none. So anyway, good luck with all that, Doc. Thanks for the interview. Right. Great Thank city. you. All right. Well, I want to thank this week's guest, Dr. Kerry Kenny. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Uh, my host, my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Slotnick, the Restoration Global Watchdog, Pete Consigli. John, you got to have faith at the controls. By the way, next week we do have Jeffrey Siegel back. Dr. Siegel will be joining us, who uh, was mentioned earlier in the show. So we'll, we'll go into a little more detail maybe on the filters next week and uh, some other new things he's working on. But uh, please come back next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. <laughs>